Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, or of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. The title of the sermon that I'll be preaching now is called Ordination and Church Planting. Ordination, it's primarily on ordination. We're going to touch on church planting but primarily in, on ordination. So I had originally planned to go through the qualifications of a bishop. I was going to start today, but I decided, no, I just want to go top level right now. Let's look at ordination. Let's look a bit on, on church planting. Then we can understand a, a better as to why we, why we or well, the qualifications that we would be looking at to ordain a, a person. But I want you to notice there in Hebrews chapter 6 that the command as a church, as it grows, as it matures, is that we would leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And what we see following on to that are, are, are doctrines that are known as the doctrine of Christ. These are basic doctrines that any church should know, basic doctrines that anyone should understand. And then it says, let us go unto perfection. So let us mature, let us grow, let us be more complete as brethren. And then it says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. You know, we, we don't need to resave everybody again. We don't need to go through salvation, you know, week in and week out. And some churches do that, don't they? Some churches are preaching the gospel week in, week. No, it's time to move on. <laughs> Once we've, we've laid that, we know people are saved, we move on. And of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms. So obviously someone that gets baptized should be baptized after they're saved. Something, then we move on, we become complete, we become more mature. And of the laying on of hands. So we see that the laying on of hands, and what, I, what I'm saying to you at this point, this is about ordination. And we'll cover that later on. We'll see how that, how that ties into ordination. But this is something that is known, should be known as a basic common doctrine in the church. Now, I've not preached on this, you know, since we started the church. I haven't really felt like we needed to. We're a new church, you know, to the point where we get to to the point where we need to ordain people. Might still be, you know, a few years away. But now that we're going through this class, I thought it was important that we look at the lane on of hands. And then it says, you know, the resurrection of the dead. So the rapture, the resurrection and of eternal judgment. These are, these are basic things, okay? basic concepts of the Bible known as the doctrines of Christ. All right, So we're going to be looking at the laying of hands, which is, in, which is associated with ordination. But when you read the New Testament, the laying of hands is also associated with passing on or proving um, the apostolic, apostolic, apostolic gifts. I haven't said that right. But proving that one was an apostle, proving that one could pass on those gifts, such as healing of the dead, you know, of uh, speaking in tongues, you know, that was also passed through by the laying of hands, but that's outside of the scope of the sermon today. Right now, I want to be looking at the ordination of deacons and of pastors. So please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 19, the Bible reads, Against an elder, now the Bible uses the word elder, pastor, bishop interchangeably for the same office. And it says here, Against an elder, if you want to say a pastor, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Rebuke them that sin, sorry, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. So look, when the pastor sins, Obviously, the pastor sins every day, just like you do, but, you know, gets into grievous sins that damages the office of the pastor, they are to be called out, it says there, right? It says to, they ought to be rebuked before all. When a pastor sins, it's not time to hide that sin. It, you know, you're not needing to look after that person's reputation. In order to protect the church, the pastor's sins need to be called out. It says there. And then it says in verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. You know, don't give that pastor preference. You know, don't make it easy for them if they disqualify themselves. No, call them out, rebuke them for the sins. Okay? You know, um, God's not a, a respecter of persons. Neither should we be in that sense. And then it said there in verse 20, uh, sorry, doing nothing by partiality. So, you know, so, so when you do things, don't do it, you know, don't, don't be biased in the way you go about it. 
You know, don't, don't um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Have, have favorites in your church where you call out, you know, the, the people that you don't like for their sins, but the people that your best friends that you're close to, you won't call them out for their sins. No, we need to make sure that we treat everybody alike. But the pastor, you know, because of the office they hold, if they commit grievous sins, that needs to be known throughout the whole church. Now, that's important because when you look at verse number 22, it says, lay hands suddenly on no man. And we'll see that this is about ordination. Because pastors need to be rebuked sharply when there is sin, we need to make sure that before we lay our hands on them, before we ordain them, you know, we don't do it suddenly. We don't do it quickly. We make sure that the person that gets ordained has been proven in the church. That people can, you know, uh, the church as a whole, and we'll look at this later on, you know, acknowledges, yes, this is the person that God is calling. Yes, this is the person that needs to take on this office. So we need to be mindful when, when it comes to ordination, it's not something we need to rush into. It's not something we, we need to feel like we, we, we need to do it regardless. No, don't lay your hands suddenly on no man. This is neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Now, this is written to Timothy from Paul. Timothy was a pastor. In the instruction, Paul the apostle is giving Timothy, look, keep yourself pure. Make sure you, you don't ordain someone suddenly because if they go and they, and they get into grievous sin, it's going to reflect bad on you. It's going, you're going to, you're, you, you may be considered by God to be a partaker of that man's sin. Keep thyself pure. You know, ordination is something where, you know, if I'm going to ordain someone, I need to make sure I have a pure conscience before God that this is the right man that can do this job. This is someone that's proven themselves. This one that's mature. It's not someone that will necessarily, you know, get into some grievous sin, you know. Keep yourself pure. Now, could it be that I ordain someone in the future and they get into grievous sin? Of course that's possible. But with, with everything that we can, we can do, with everything we can accomplish and, and, and check of that man, we need to make sure that at that point our conscience is, conscience is pure. All right? Now, that's important because, like I said, the elder, the pastor, has a significant position in the church. All right? Turn to Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. So should we be, yes, we should be mindful before we ordain someone, but should we be so afraid of it that we don't ordain them? No, because Titus was also a pastor. Titus was also a bishop. In the instruction that Paul gives Titus here, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. What's Crete? It's an island, okay? It's an, it's an island, um, and it has a number of cities on there. It says that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting to ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So Paul does, you know, want his, his bishops, his pastors to ordain other pastors. You know, it ought to be our goal and our ambition to one day ordain other pastors. You know, to start new churches. These are things that are commanded to a pastor to do. And you can see that Paul leaves a bishop. He leaves Titus there in Crete to do it. You know, that should immediately tell you that the only way a pastor can be ordained is by another pastor. Okay, or well, in these days when you had the apostles who also held a higher authority than the pastors, they also had the ability to ordain elders, as Paul had ordained uh, Titus himself. Okay, but today we don't have the apostles, but we do have the office of the of the bishop, the, the office of the pastor, and it's the pastor's responsibility to ordain pastors. All right. Please go back. Oh, should sure, sure. anyway. Go back to First Timothy. Back back to First Timothy chapter four. You're nearby anyway. And before I move off Titus, it says that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. You know, ordination is an orderly process. Not something to be taken lightly, not something that we ought to rush into. We've got to be mindful of it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. This is the instruction that Paul tells to Timothy. He says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He says, Look, Timothy, you were given a gift. Okay, when you were ordained to be a pastor, a, a gift was passed down to you when the presbytery laid their hands upon you. Now, that word presbytery is not saying that we need to leave the Baptist church and join the Presbyterian church. Okay, the word presbytery just means um, the elders, the pastors. 
Okay? Some churches may have more than one pastor. And in that case here, all those pastors should be involved in ordaining that man. You know, we, we might be one day, we don't know, in good fellowship with another church in our area. I hope so. You know? And if I choose to ordain a man, I might invite a pastor from another church to participate and be part of that. I don't know. You know? But we can see that you know, ordination can be one person, just like uh, Titus was left in Crete, the one person to ordain. Or it can be done by the presbytery, by people that have, uh, by, by multiple pastors. It really doesn't matter. But the key thing is that it's the pastor ordaining the pastors. All right? And um, so I just want you to notice that, that it, the, the gift that was given to Timothy was by the laying of hands. All right? Now, when it comes to the laying of hands or ordination, it's not something that's only found in the New Testament. The principles behind it started back in the Old Testament. So I want us to do an Old Testament study. Please take your Bibles and then turn to uh, Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8, verse number 1. Leviticus chapter 8, verse number 1. So we know the story of Moses delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, and then once they received the commandments and, and all that, you know, the Lord had instructed Moses to appoint priests. And his own brother Aaron became the first high priest. Okay? And what we see here in the book of Leviticus is that um, Moses ordains his brother to be a priest, to take an office in the house of God. Let's look at it, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we see here that the Lord commands Moses, it's time for you to ordain uh, Aaron and his sons to be priests. Now, does, does, uh, does the Lord ask Moses to do something privately when nobody can see it? No, he says, look, you need to do it before the, or, before the congregation. Okay? Now, this is the first point that I want you to understand. What is a biblical ordination? Well, actually, point number one was that elders appoint elders. People that hold a position of authority will ordain others. Okay? And in this case, uh, the prophet of God, or you know, we see Moses as, as even the first pastor of the, of, the, of the children of God in the Old Testament, is ordaining the priests. That's point number one. But point number two is that they were to be brought before the congregation. All right? So, you know, you, you might, there might be a, a case where someone's been ordained by a pastor, but it's all been hush-hush, it's been quiet, it's not been presented before the congregation. Then in that case, as far as I'm concerned, they're not biblically qualified, uh, or, or they're not biblically ordained to be a pastor. Because we see, we'll see this happen time and time again. Yes, the laying of hands. Yes, someone in authority. But then they had to pre be presented before the congregation. All right? Let's keep reading. Look at verse number five. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put upon him the coat. So you can see that it's Moses doing these acts upon them. He actually washes them. He puts on the coats and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with a robe and put the ephod upon him and he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith and he put on the breastplate upon him. Also he put in the breastplate the uh, Urim and the Thummim. Thummim. And he put the mitre upon his head, also upon the mitre, even upon his forehead, did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now drop down to verse 36. Look at this. Uh, so Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Do you see that? How, how the Lord uses that phrase? You know, the, the Aaron, his sons, they're, they're ordained, they're doing the things that God has commanded, but by the hand of Moses. Okay? It, was, it was Moses who was ordaining these priests before the congregation. Now, I know that phrase is figurative, you know, by the hand of Moses, that it's through Moses that they were ordained. But, but I, I love the choice of words that God used, even as figurative language. That it's, it's the laying of hands. It, it's the, the purpose is that there is something physical that's happened. And we see how, how it was Moses that was, was uh, uh, washing them, was dressing them, was getting them ready and presented before the congregation. 
So we can say that, that by the hand of Moses is something that's figurative, but also physical, something that is literal, that took place. So we see the Old Testament uh, priests were ordained by a man of God. All right? Now turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. And as you're turning there, you, again, you know, this, you continue the story of Moses, you know, a great man of God, but then he, he, he failed. You know, he, he messed up with God. And, and as his punishment, he was not to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He was allowed to go up into a mount and, and to look down on the plains and to see what God had promised the children of Israel, but he was not permitted to go into the land of, of Israel, all right? Or the land of Canaan at that point it was known as, the land of Canaan. He was not allowed to do that. And so God instructed him to get another man, and that man became Joshua, okay? Joshua was the leader that took over and, and led the children of Israel into the promised land. But look at Numbers chapter 27, verse 15. After God gives Moses this bad news, and look, and Moses is a great example of a humble man. He's a great example of a great pastor that actually loves his brethren, that loves the people. Because the Lord just told him the bad news. You're not going into the land. Does Moses whinge about it? Does he get upset about it? Does, you know, is he selfish? Now, how does he respond? Look at verse 15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, Set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. You see his heart for the people. He says, look, yes, Lord, I understand. I, I'm being punished. I'm not, I'm not leading these people in. But Lord, instead of me being selfish and, and, and having a pity party for myself, he says, look, but, the, but the, the, the sheep have no shepherd. Can we set a man that can go before them and lead them into that place? That's a great heart that Moses has. He doesn't want to leave the sheep without a shepherd. He doesn't want the sheep to go astray. Verse 18, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, hey, a man that is saved, Okay, man that, that, that believes on God, that believes on Jesus Christ, a man that's saved, that has the Spirit of God in him, and says, And lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. So now we see another uh, ordination process here, where Moses is ordaining the next pastor, where Moses is ordaining the next leader, Joshua. And look, Joshua was a man that's been faithfully serving beside Moses for many, many years. He's a man that's known, okay, by the children of Israel. And he says, look, you're going to lay your hands upon him and you're going to bring him before the priest and before all the congregation. We see the same thing playing out again, right? The laying of hands before the congregation. Verse number 20. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Say, so what's that about? And thou shalt put some of thine honor, okay? Now again, this is why we don't believe in self-ordination, okay? Because it's the man of God, Moses, who's instilling his honor upon Joshua. And by that, it's his authority, it's his power, it's, it's, it's the, um, yeah, the authority that God had given Moses to be the leader of Israel. Moses is basically giving that authority onto Joshua, okay? This is why it's got to be a man of authority that's ordaining another man of authority, because he's bestowing upon that person some of that honor, some of that authority, okay? And if, if you're self-ordained, you're not receiving that honor whatsoever. You call yourself pastor. Hey, I can put doctor before, before my name. I, I can do whatever I want. You can call, call me Dr. Sepulveda. I mean, that's what, this, that's what C.I. Schofield did, right? He put doctor before his name. No, he's not received the honor. He's not received the proper process, you know? And, and it's so ridiculous, people that think they can ordain themselves, they're not receiving the honor. They're not receiving the authority. Uh, and, and of course, that's going to fail. That's going to fail badly. But we see that it's important that pastors ordain pastors. Verse 21. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord, at his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. You see how God just keeps repeating that? So it's in our minds, okay, it's before all the congregation. It's not a secret. 
It's not just, you know, in the tent, in, you know. No, it's before everybody. In verse 23, And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. The reason why ordination ought to be by the laying of hands before the congregation is because it's the commandment of God. Amen. Okay, ordination is a command of God. It's, it's, it's also a basic doctrine, a doctrine of Christ. Okay, this is... It's funny how people just try to get away with what the Word of God says. You know, and, and people say, well, why doesn't God just lay it out for us? Why doesn't He just tell us, okay, this is how you go into ordain a pastor, you know, in the books of... Look, there's so much Bible already, and it's, it's always consistent. Why do we need further instruction from God? You know, if you've read your Bibles, you should know what the ordination process is. And pastor that self-ordain, it's like, I don't even trust this person. Have you not even read these passages? You know, why would I trust that person? You know, it's crazy. Um, now, can you guys go to the book of Deuteronomy, please? Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Because I want to show you something else as well. And why self-ordination is such a failure. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. It's important for you to look at this one up. So I'll give you a moment to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. The Bible reads, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. You say, why? How did that come to be? For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Do you see when Joshua was ordained by Moses? When, 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 when he was biblically ordained, he was given the spirit of wisdom. He was full of the spirit of wisdom. That tells you self-ordained people or people that are ordained by, by the layman, by the congregation, they have not received the spirit of wisdom. Now, I know this will sound prideful, but it's just a reality. And I didn't really realize this until I was putting this together. But after I was ordained, and you're going to think this is crazy, right? but I'm just telling you, it's just the truth. After I was ordained, and I was ordained biblically before the congregation by someone of, that has the authority or the office of a bishop, all right? When I prepared my sermons, I felt that I was wiser. Like, I, I could read the Bible, and it was even clearer. It, was, it, it, was, it even made more sense to me. I, I, I could, I could uh, you know, um, compare Scripture with Scripture a lot more easier than I had before. I'm not saying that I never had any wisdom. Okay? I'm not saying uh, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't know my Bible, but there's something about being ordained and something about coming to the Word of God and knowing that I've got to feed the people of God where I realize I, I've got this knowledge. I've got this wisdom. You know? And it's come from following the commands that God has given us about ordination. You see why he's got that wisdom? It's because he had Moses lay his hands upon him. Okay? And I'm telling you the same thing. If you get ordained one day, you'll probably find the same truth you'll probably find all of a sudden the Bible has opened up to you a lot more. Than you, and, you know, I can't really explain it to you, but I'm telling you, it's, it's the truth. Okay? And so the, these people that are self-ordained, these people that don't follow the direction that God has given us, they're not people that have that spirit of wisdom. You know, it's, it's something that's special that God gives to people that are ordained biblically. All right? So why would you want to go to the church of somebody that's self-ordained? They don't follow the commands of God. Okay, they've not received the honor of that office and they don't have the spirit of wisdom. Why, why would you waste your time with these people? You know, it's crazy. I don't even want to fellowship with people that call themselves pastor and haven't been ordained scripturally. All right? They're fools. Now let's go to the New Testament. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 verse 12. By the way, I don't want you to think that just because someone gets ordained biblically, that now they're the, the wisest person. Because they might, not, they might choose not to hearken to the spirit of wisdom. They might choose to just go by their own intellect, you know, by their own natural um, you know, intelligence. But the point is, that spirit of wisdom is available to someone that is biblically ordained. And they can access that, you know, that spirit. It's, it's an amazing thing. So look at Luke, 6, Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. I want to show you how Jesus ordained. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. And it came to pass in those days when he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. 
So look, before I, I ordain, I think this is a really good thing. If Jesus Christ had to go into a quiet place and pray all night, then I'm going to be doing the same thing. I might even be mixing prayer and fasting. You know, before I lay my hands on someone, before I ordain someone, before I make such an important decision like that, we say that even Jesus Christ goes into the mountain and prays all night speaking to God. Look at verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. Now notice when it says his disciples, he's not just talking about the twelve. He's talking about everybody that is literally following him. Not all the multitudes, because some of the multitudes were not his disciples. But those that had left all, that had followed after him, he calls the disciples, and then it says, and of them he chose twelve. So of all the disciples he has before him, of that group, of them, he chooses twelve, whom he named apostles. So we don't see Jesus laying his hands on them. The Bible doesn't tell us that. I think it's safe to assume that's what he did. Okay, but I'm not going to be dogmatic on that. But what we do see is that he chooses 12 from, from all the disciples. And so as, as he ordains them to be apostles, they are before the public. They are before a greater you know, number of disciples before him. Again, it's not something that was done in secret. Turn to the book of Mark. Turn to the book of Mark, chapter 3. Mark, chapter 3. So we'll just get Mark's interpretation to this. Mark, chapter 3, verse 13. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. It says, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him who he would. So Jesus Christ is heading to a mountain. He says to his disciples, You know, everyone that can come, come, you know. And they came, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve. That, see the, the word there, ordained. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon, his surname Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them uh, Boernages, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and, uh, and Thaddeus, the, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. So again, I just want to show you, Jesus goes into the mountain, calls everyone that is willing to come up to come, and out of that group, he ordains 12. Again, it was before the people of God, okay? And then they go into the house, okay? It's not done privately. Okay, now go to the book of Genesis, please. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Because I just want to show you there that ordination is a man of authority, and of course, who's got greater authority than Jesus Christ? He's fine to do this. He can ordain his apostles. But we see always men of authority ordaining other men to that position of authority. Okay? Otherwise, we see God directly ordaining those individuals, either through Jesus Christ or by the angel of the Lord, potentially in the Old Testament. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's important to understand this principle. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yield in seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed, uh, seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So we see that everything that God creates, the grass and the, ve the vegetation, it produces seed after its own kind. And God says, this is good. Okay? So if we apply this to ordination, it's good for pastors to ordain pastors after their kind. Again, it's not a self-ordination. Okay? It, it's it's, it's got to produce after its kind. It's not the church congregation ordaining a man because that church congregation does not have the authority of the pastor. Okay? They're not producing after their kind. You know? So we need to be careful. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 21, Genesis 1, 21. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. So let's just take very basic principles. Genesis chapter 1, you know, that things produce after their own kind. And God says, this is good. And then it says, be fruitful and multiply. 
Meaning that as a pastor, I can't just have the mindset of a temporary thing and say, well, I'm just going to, you know, this is my church and I, this is my baby. This is all I'm focused on. At some point, we've got to get to it as a church and as myself as a pastor and say, well, now we need to multiply, be fruitful and multiply. You know, we need to ordain other men of God. We need to send them out in, in other places here in Australia, maybe even New Zealand, ordain them to start churches. Or if there's already a group of brethren to go there and get things established, get things in order. You know, but that's the principle that we see of God. I think it's a great principle that we can take to the whole Bible. I think there's a reason why this is Genesis chapter 1, okay? Things that are very basic, things that are very uh, fundamental to many, many doctrines in the Bible. Turn back to Acts chapter 20, please. Acts chapter 20. I'm going to show you a, 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 a verse here in the Bible that I've heard self-ordained pastors use to say that they're biblically ordained. All right? <laughs> Let's have a look at it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. <clears throat> Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he have purchased with his own blood. Don't you see there, Pastor Kevin? You know, it's not men ordaining other men as pastors, as overseers of the church of God. The Holy Ghost made me an overseer. Anyone that's biblically ordained has been sent forth by the Holy Ghost. All right? If you've been biblically ordained. All right? Now, how do we answer this? You know, when we read the book of Acts, do we start with Acts chapter 20? Is that where we start? You know, a book of, you know when, you, when you buy a novel, you just open up to a random chapter and start reading from there? No, you start from the beginning. Start from the beginning. What does it mean to have been sent um, by the Holy Ghost? What does it mean that the Holy Ghost has made you an overseer? You know, but yeah, I've, I've seen people twist this verse. Now, let me say this. The Holy Ghost has ordained, or God has ordained men of God. It happens in the Bible. But the thing is, I can confirm that because it's in the Word of God. I can read it and I trust the Word of God is true. I trust the Word of God is pure. So when I look at someone like a Moses, who was called by the burning bush, you know, I know that was the Lord speaking to him to, to be, you know, and ordained as such, then I can, I can look, yeah, that's in the Bible. You know, but if you come and tell me you were ordained by the Holy Ghost, well, show me that in the Bible. Where were you ordained? In the, in, you know, but otherwise, it'd be in the Word of God if I'm going to trust that. We have many men in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, where we see them being called directly by God. But it's recorded for us so we can have the proof. All right? We start with the Word of God. Go to Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch. Now this church in Antioch, a super duper church awesome church awesome all right but look at this in the antioch certain prophets and teachers okay part of what made this church really strong really great is that they had multiple prophets multiple preachers okay and teachers you know we can see that this church had matured this church had grown it, it had the ability of multiple men to help lead that church that's a great thing and then it says, as Barnabas and Simeon, there was called Nigar and Lucius of Cyrene and, and Menean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So there it is again. Before being ordained, you know, we saw Jesus praying. I said I'll probably link fasting in there. And the reason for that is because we see that here in this passage. And look at this. Uh, when, they're, when they're ministering to the Lord, they're serving the Lord, they're fasting. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So how does, in the New Testament, how does the Holy Ghost call you to be a pastor? How does he call you to be ordained? It's in the local church. It's in the local church amongst the prophets, amongst the teachers, amongst the congregation. Okay? That's where they heard from the Holy Ghost. That's how they were confirmed, hey, this is the person that we need to set aside and separate. For the, for the work that God has called them. Look at verse number three. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto uh, Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So how does the Holy Ghost send forth? Through the local church. 
through men of God that laid hands on them and ordained them to, to be the apostles or the missionaries for the work of the church in Antioch. And one thing you need to understand as you read through your Bible, as you read through the book of Acts, as you read the letters, the epistles that Paul writes to the churches, he's not doing it on his own. He's doing it under the authority of the local church. He's doing it under the authority of the church in Antioch. Okay? They're the ones that sent him out to go and start churches, to do the work of God, and they were ordained, him and Barnabas, ordained by the church, and by extension, because they were ordained by the church, they were sent out by the Holy Ghost. Okay? So that's how we understand chapter 20, you know, the, the one that gets twisted by the self-ordaining preachers. So just to start wrapping things up now, guys, everything produces after its own kind, okay? A self-ordained pastor or, or a pastor that's not been biblically qualified, you know, they're lacking the spirit of wisdom, they're lacking the sending forth of the Holy Ghost, you know, and they haven't received the authority and power of, of another man of authority, I mean, why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, you're just, you're, you're just saying, God, I'm going to fail. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just going to be disobedient, God. I'm going to do this anyway. And I'm going to fail. It's, it's, like, it's, it's the most ridiculous thing. And, you know, I told you guys, with one of my previous churches, where they would not ordain me because of the end times. You know, and, and I had several people in the church say to me, we well, don't need, you know, you don't need their blessing. Just go and start a church. I was like, What? <laughs> You, you want me to be like, like these failures, these self-ordained pastors? No. You know what? You might have a desire to be a pastor, to be a deacon, but you also, if you're, if you're someone that wants to be that way, you also have, the, have to have the right character. And that character says, hey, God, if it's not your will, I have to accept that. You know, if it's not your will, I, I, I'm willing to, Lord, just, just, just be a faithful uh, servant to the church. I'm faithful to uh, just to, to do my best in the local church. And if it's not your will for me to be ordained, if it's not the Holy Ghost's uh, uh, will for me to be sent out, then I have to accept that. Hey, that shows good character. And for those that go about and ordain themselves or those that go about and reject the authority that God has put over them in the church, they're not cut out to be pastors. We saw Moses. What was his heart? Was his heart that I'm not going to go to the promised land? His heart was for the sheep. He wanted them to have a shepherd. Hey, they're the people that God is looking for. The humble. The people that love the brethren. Okay? Those that would put the brethren before themselves. And I hope I can be that for you guys. Like, I hope, you know, I think I already am there <laughs> because that's I was ordained. You know, I was already proven by the church. But I hope I can continue to grow in that love for the brethren, you know, and, and, and never make the church about me. You know, I don't want to be New Life Baptist Church. You know, when people think of New Life Baptist Church, oh, that's Pastor Kevin. No, I want people to think of New Life Baptist Church as everybody that makes up this church. Look at Acts 15, please. I am wrapping up. Acts 15, verse 36. So after Paul and Barnabas go, get many people saved in many cities, they go and actually establish churches. Now, this is the little bit that I want to talk about planting churches, okay? They get brethren saved, those brethren meet, okay, and they're, and they're operating as churches without ordained pastors, okay? Because they need time. They need time for pastors to develop, all right? And look at Acts 15, verse 36. And what I want to say there, guys, is that churches plant churches, okay? Barnabas and Paul were church planters, okay, but operated under the authority of the Antioch church. Churches plant churches, you know. Um, everything produces after its own kind. And uh, it says here in Acts 15, verse 36, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, so this is, this is sometime later on, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Okay, so... You know, we see their heart. It's like, yes, we've got all these brethren saved. All these churches have started. This is, what, this is the whole purpose of the epistles, of Paul sending letters and, and encouraging them, guiding them. And he says, look, now we've, we've got to go back and make sure they're okay. You know? And um, eventually, yeah, you know, eventually these, pe these churches will have ordained pastors. And I just want to say this. Um, I don't want you to ever think that church equals pastor. Okay? I never want you to think that way. Churches start churches. If you want to look, consider our satellite church down in Sydney, that's a legitimate church. That church was planted by this church up here. 
But that church does not have a full-time pastor. Right now, I'm, I'm kind of the pastor. And, I, and in, in a sense, like, like what Paul and Barnabas says, let us go again and visit the brethren, you know, because of planes, I get to do that every week. You know, praise God that we have that luxury to get on to, to a plane. I get to visit them every week. Okay? But my hope is one day I'd be able to ordain someone to look after that church. You know, to go and ordain and set that in order. And uh, so I just want you to, you know, be mindful. Look, you know, a, a group of friends getting together in a city, you know, we can't find a good church, you know, and, and like-minded brethren coming together. That is not a church. Okay, that is not a church. Now, you can preach to one another, you can teach each other, do Bible studies, sing praises. I think that's perfectly fine. But you don't want to call that a church because churches plant churches. Churches start churches. All right? Now, also think about this. We are a leg legitimate church because we were planted by a church. But if I were to die, or if I were to get so old and you know, I can't pastor anymore, I've got to retire or something, or I get disqualified as a pastor, and let's say this church has no pastor, does that mean we stop becoming a, being a church? No. That's what I'm saying. I don't want you to think church equals pastor. All right? But a church must be planted by another church, and pastors must be ordained by another pastor. So if something were to happen to me, you know, God forbid, I never want to be unqualified or anything like that crazy. But, you know, something health-wise or, you know, whatever happens to me and we don't have someone already ordained in the church, then, you know, the next step for you would be to, hey, we need to have an ordained pastor. We need a man that has the spirit of wisdom. And, you know, hopefully contact other churches and ask other pastors, do you have a man that you can send our way that can help guide this sheep, that can help guide us, continue, continue guide us into that promised land? Okay, but please never get to a point where you're like, you know what? It's been two years where without a pastor, let's just ordain brother Matt or something, right? Let's just ordain brother Sam. No, you know, then you're 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 being disobedient to the word of God. This is why this is important that it gets preached. It's because I we see that in churches today, we see that churches just just for the sake of having a pastor, whatever, will just you don't have any kids or you got one kid. Uh, yeah, you're good enough. You know, you, you, you've been serving the Lord the longest. You've been putting the most money into the tithes and offering. You know, we'll make you the pastor. You know, no, no, look, we, we've got to obey the commands that God has given us, you know. And I hope we as a church plant churches. But the ideal scenario is that we would plant them with a pastor. That's the ideal scenario. And not rush into these things, okay. So I hope that's given you um, a little bit more insight into the process of ordination, a little bit more process in, uh, insight into the process of plants and churches, and what I believe, you know, what I believe as a pastor. And, um, you know, as we continue going through this every month, I want to start looking into, the, um, into the, uh, the qualifications of a bishop, the qualifications of a, of a deacon, and maybe even touch on evangelists as well, and what's that all about. And, yeah, I just, I just I want us as a church to be united, to be of one mind, to know what the Bible says, and I think you can just see the consistency already in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament that men, or, you know, pastors ordain pastors and that churches plant churches. All right, let's pray.